Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, I want to welcome you all to today's discussion uh, on exploring the implications of the Russian invasion of Ukraine on international peace, security, finance, and counterterrorism efforts. And thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, my name is Ilko Kessels. I'm the executive director uh, of the Global Center on Cooperative Security, uh, and it's my pleasure to open today's meeting. Uh, before I hand over uh, to, today's, to today's moderator, Tori Holt, uh, I want to share a few uh, words with you. Uh, at this point in time, uh, residents in eastern Ukraine and elsewhere have already endured eight years of conflict. And now, one month into Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, the intensification and spread of the conflict throughout the country risk a scale of death and destruction that are extremely frightening. More than 3 million refugees, uh, more than double that amount in IDPs, uh, thousands of civilian casualties, uh, the human impact of the current conflict is unimaginable. It's the largest refugee crisis in Europe uh, since the Second World War, with now a quarter of the Ukrainian population displaced. Of course, in addition to causing the immense suffering of the brave people of Ukraine and sacrificing young Russian soldiers for lies and deceit, the Russian invasion may fundamentally affect our international normative system and our peace and security architecture. From the functioning of the UN Security Council and legitimacy of organizations uh, that Russia is a member of, to the ripple effects of sanctions, the pressures of IDP and refugee populations, and the challenge of managing the return of foreign fighters participating in the conflict. The impacts that may flow from uh, this conflict are ever evolving and cannot be overstated. And I think it's important to note here, of course, that this is not the only conflict deserving our attention right now. And the inconsistent coverage and responses to the conflict speak to broader global injustices, racism, and gross human rights violations. It is clear that on multiple fronts, human rights, the rule of law, and human security are under assault. The Global Center on Cooperative Security works to achieve lasting security by advancing inclusive human rights-based policies, partnerships, and practices to address the root causes of violent extremism. And this work is premised on international multi-stakeholder cooperation from grassroots actors that work within their communities to uh, prevent violence to senior UN and government officials uh, deliberating on policies and strategies to respond to this at a national and international level. We seek to further the rule of law, to further human rights and further human security. And while of course our immediate thoughts are first and foremost with all those individuals affected by the Russian invasion, we're also carefully and with concern monitoring the conflict uh, with regards to its immediate, mid and long-term consequences. And some of these consequences include, firstly, its impact on international norms, rule of law and accountability. Will Russia be held accountable for its actions and through what means? How does this compare to and reflect on accountability in relation to um, terrorism, state-sponsored terrorism, for instance, and who and what protects international norms and the rule of law? will reflect on the consequences for multilateralism. What does this conflict tell us about the state of multilateralism and how does it affect our international peace and security architecture? What actions do institutions need to take to remain legitimate and credible? We're considering the conflict's impact on foreign fighters. You know, what are their profiles? What are their motivations uh, for those joining different groups and different sides in the conflict of Ukraine? How do they and the reaction to them differ from recent foreign fighter flows to other conflicts like Syria and Iraq? And what does that tell us uh, about government approaches? And what is the impact of the presence of these fighters, not just on the current conflict, but also in the longer term, in terms of their uh, re reintegration into their countries of origin? We're looking at the consequences for the international financial system and sanctions. What has been the efficiency and the impact of the sanct sanctions and financial actions that have been undertaken? What roles do cryptocurrency and digital assets play in evading sanctions? And what does this say about the state of our international sanctions and anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism regimes? And finally, of course, we keep an eye on uh, how this conflict worsens uh, and affects drivers of violence. In addition to the immediate impacts uh, of the conflict in human lives, how do other, um, how do other drivers of violence are, uh, affect, be affected by this conflict on the longer term? What's the effect of sanctions, the experience trauma, and many of the other aspects uh, of being part uh, of this conflict uh, on the well-being of individuals. We're joined today by a fantastic panel who will reflect on these various aspects under the guidance and moderation of Global Center board member Tori Holt, who is the director of the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding at Dartmouth College. A couple of practical notes before turning over to Tori. Throughout the meeting, please use the Q&A function for substantive questions only. Thank you to all those who have already provided questions upon registering. 
We've shortlisted interventions and pre-submitted questions, but we'll also try and tackle as many questions as possible that come up uh, in the Q&A function. So please uh, do feel free uh, to raise questions there uh, throughout the event. If you experience any technical difficulties, uh, please contact my colleague, Ms. Adele Westerhuis, directly via the chat function. Today's event is being live streamed and recorded. We also, of course, welcome you to engage with us and the panelists on social media during and after the event. Thank you for the Global Center uh, team for the preparations uh, for today's meeting. And it's now my pleasure to hand it over to today's moderator. Tori, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elko. It's a pleasure to join you and this uh, esteemed panel today. I really appreciate the Global Center putting this event together. I've long admired the center's work because you combined working at the local level with grassroots activists and leadership all the way to the tops of governments in the United Nations. So I really do think the center brings a, a wide range of points of view together and you understand the root causes more than many that lead to terrorism. And you have worked hard to try and link that to international human rights and efforts for peace. So in addition, your organization, like many, is presumed that there are certain rules of the road. And I think you're right to point out that we're at a time where the premise that sovereignty is important as is territorial integrity and that countries do not invade each other is really under assault. Um, so I'm delighted to be here. And the question about how the Russian invasion of Ukraine most recently, a month ago, has affected the global system as well as the people of Ukraine is timely. As you noted, the human cost is pretty extraordinary. Yesterday, UNICEF marked the, a tough number that half, over half the uh, children of Ukraine have fled their homes roughly. Um, we know the numbers, they almost become a bit dizzying to say 3.7 million are now refugees from Ukraine and that roughly 6.5 million more have been internally displaced. This does not even include other countries in the region and the impact. So we'll, we'll look into that, but we'll turn also to questions about the political solutions. People are looking for off ramps. They're looking, looking for with hope at peace talks, but not yet seen much progress. Um, while the Security Council remains blocked in part or in great part because of Russia's role there, we did see the UN vote this week to condemn Russians actions and call out the impact on the humanitarian side. Uh, the IAEA, unfortunately, remains concerned about the safety and security of nuclear facilities in Ukraine, and there's worrying conversations about both the use of chemical weapons and those of mass destruction as a fear of escalation. But our panel today will bring, as you have noted, real interest and focus to a few key elements, including Ukraine's call for foreign fighters and what are the implications of those going to join the fight in Ukraine, both in the immediate and long term and how does this compare to other conflicts and how we can think about the long-term consequences of that. Also with the international financial system and sanctions, it's been a pretty amazing um, shift to watch sanctions not come through the UN Security Council, but be put together by a coalition of nations, allies and partners, both in sanctions and impacts on the international financial sectors aimed directly at Russia's economy, but with implications worldwide. And then, of course, multilateralism. The very nature of the system was built around trying to prevent threats to national peace and security, whether they be terrorism, conflict, war, humanitarian crises. And I think it's right to put a spotlight on where, we, where we're going next. So with that, you've already given the format. Um, again, just to repeat, we'll go through each speaker. Um, we'll have a short uh, presentation. If you've got a wonderful question, please start adding that to the Q&A function. If you've written in ahead of time, we know some of you uh, would like to come on camera and join us. So that will happen after all of our speakers have presented. Our first speaker, let me turn to, is Kasper Reykjavik, who's a PhD and a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Research on Extremis Extremism at the University of Oslo. He is actually gonna be joining us with a video message regarding the history of foreign fighters in Ukraine and the consequences given the influx there. Let us go to his remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Kacper Rekavec. I'm, the post I'm, a, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Research on Extremism at the University of Oslo in Norway. Thank you for having me. And uh, as a way of introducing myself, I will just say that I've been looking at the foreign fighters, volunteers, 
who went to Ukraine for the last uh, for the last eight years essentially so since the beginning of this very very conflict and I just wanted to really say a few things at the beginning to kind of like you know lay the ground for 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 the discussion and hope uh, this actually sparks a discussion so first of all this mobilization mobilization for 2022 so to speak is different than the mobilization for 2014 the 2014 one was more cohesive more united and per capita it featured a higher number of individuals whom we could call extremists this is not the case now it's a slightly different thing and i'll tell you more about that in a in a second secondly ukraine speaks about a foreign legion but there will be no one unit called foreign legion most probably and certainly not at this very not at this very moment we have to realize that it is a public relations exercise also and when it was launched it was launched at a very bad moment in the war for ukraine so at that very time it looked like the last roll of the dice so do not look for you know international brigades for now at least Look for people who will be distributed among different units to plug certain gaps, people with certain specialities or capabilities, and sometimes random foreigners assigned to a given Ukrainian Ukrainian unit of the territorial, territorial defense. Thirdly, do realize that these individuals are not a priority for Ukrainians. You know, Ukraine needs weapons, Ukraine needs weapon systems, it does not need essentially the volunteers, as you know, there are ten, tens of thousands of, if we could say hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians who are actually returning home from the work somewhere in Europe to actually fight in this war, you know. The, the foreigners are a nice addition, they might help with the internationalization of this conflict, they, mi they might help with, you know, beaming a certain public relations message by Ukraine, but U Ukraine will fight regardless of whether these fighters survive. And sometimes they are very much unhappy with the fact that they're not prioritized by Ukrainians and they will not be prioritized at all. You know, there's a story from 2014 when, you know, foreign volunteers felt a bit like a backpack to some of the Ukrainian troops in the field, because if you do not speak the languages, either Ukrainian or Russian, you will not be prioritized and you will be simply be assigned to a Ukrainian soldier who speaks English. And for him, that will be a bit of an issue to actually, you know, baby, babysit you. So in this sense, we should not be surprised that Ukrainians are not prioritizing this, this very issue. This is not something that with which, you know, they, they go, you know, they go to sleep and wake up and for, that the first thing they're thinking about is the foreign, the, the, you know, the wealth, so to speak, of the, of the, of the foreign, uh, foreign volunteers. Secondly, however, if you persevere, and if you have good connections on the ground with some of the veterans, be it foreigners or Ukrainians, or you yourself, you're a veteran, and you are patient, you will get to the front lines and you will most probably fight. But in line with the backpack theory, again, you might not be assigned a gig that you would like to be assigned to. So, you know, those stories about uh, operators of some, you know, missile launchers who are now basically, you know, grunts and then, you know, in infantry, this is what you are going to get as again ukrainians will not prioritize you they will simply put you where they think they need you and not where you you would like to be put and where, where you would like to serve unless you are very well connected like some of the veterans of the special forces who apparently joined up with the ukrainian special forces units nowadays so that but that's easier you know they speak the language they have the connections so that was probably easy more easily more easily done Next thing, it is about veterans. It is about foreign veterans who stayed in the country in 2014 or people who fought in 2014 and they can now easily mobilize their friends and colleagues. They are basically beacons on the hill as far as recruitment is concerned. They, are, they represent certain formations and I'll be talking about one such formation in a second where basically th these formations, they were readying themselves for this situation since 2014. They had a head start. They had a head start in recruitment of foreigners because they were waiting for them or they tried to lure, uh, kind of, you know, entice them into coming into the country from 20, let's say 15, 16, when the war was kind of mostly silent in a way, although it wasn't over. Uh, they struggled with this because they couldn't offer them anything. And now they can offer them almost anything. And that's why people flock to them. And that's why we should be looking for some of these units. And of course, everybody asks me about one unit, which is Azov. Everybody thinks that most of those foreign fighters actually join some kind of a nationalist militia and they will come back and terrorize people back, uh, back in their home countries. That's not the case. So far, Azov's uh, international recruitment efforts are, let's say, mildly successful to put the least. They're not bringing in people whom they had known from before the war. These are new people for them who are not ideologically attuned to Azov's message. They go there because they recognize a certain fighting brand, not so much an ideological brand. Uh, 
And of course, they will try to mold them into something useful, but uh, it takes time. And at the very moment, this recruitment process is is basically basically largely nowhere. You know, you're talking thirty maybe individuals out of uh, out of uh, you know hundreds that crossed the border or attempted to get to Kiev. So you know, that angle we shouldn't really worry about that uh, that very angle at the very at the very moment. So these were my f- few points. Hope uh, this is of use. Uh, do enjoy the rest of the of the event, and I look forward to hearing from you, and then maybe catching up with you at some at some other venue and at some other event. Thank you. All the best. Well, thank you very much to Casper for sharing his analysis with us. Um, next, I'd like to turn to Colin Clark, who is the Senior Research Fellow in the Sufan Center. He is the director actually of research there where he focuses on domestic and transnational terrorism, international security and geopolitics. He can reflect on the current flow of foreign and voluntary fighters to the Ukraine, the unintended consequences of the conflict and the challenges in managing their return. Thank you so much, Colin, for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thanks, Tori, and, and thanks to everyone at the Global Center for this kind of invitation to, to speak here today and um, to everybody spending their time watching online. Uh, you know, Casper uh, is and has been close to this conflict in a way that, that most researchers haven't been. And so, um, you know, he's, he's a friend, he's a colleague, someone I've been in close touch with over the years studying this issue, and, and I think he brings a lot to the table. I'm going to talk a little bit about foreign fighters. I'm going to talk about volunteers. I'll touch upon mercenaries. I'm really going to be looking at the kind of broad swath of uh, what, what we call non-state actors in this conflict, um, some of the unintended consequences. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, what we're seeing on the Russian side, too, because Casper is right that um, far too often, the at least the media portrayal of what we're seeing here is very uh, narrowly focused and it tends to be focused on on Azov because that's what gets the clicks. But there's so many other things happening in the Ukrainian ecosystem, just talking about non-state actors. Um, Anytime we introduce non-state actors to the battlefield, it's going to add complexity. Um, Ukraine is no exception in that regard. It's going to be important for states to consider all of the different uh, implications should their citizens travel to the conflict zone and, and upon their return. Initially, we had, uh, you know, members of governments in the UK, Canada and elsewhere actually calling for their citizens to go and travel. I think they've since backtracked a little bit. Uh, You know, they were realized maybe they were being a bit overzealous uh, and and weren't thinking through some of the long term uh, implications. When Russian President Vladimir Putin calls for the denazification of Ukraine uh, as the pretext behind his invasion, you know, he's really relying on, in addition to the Russian military, uh, he's relying heavily on mercenaries. He's relying heavily on far-right extremists, uh, and he's relying on on terrorist groups like the Russian imperial movement. The initial mobilization, um, and and Kasper's documented a lot of these numbers, 17,000 back in in 2014 foreign foreign fighters uh, defined broadly, 15,000 were from Russia. So, you know, the gaslighting from the Kremlin is incredible, talking about uh, foreign foreign fighters going to the battlefield. Ninety percent of them are Russian. Uh, you know, RT has even kind of used different snippets of research from Western think tanks and then cut that part of it out where you talk about the Russian side. And so uh, typical uh, Russian propaganda being framed to completely ignore the Russian role in stoking all of this. Uh, and, a, and a big part of that's happened in the disinformation space. We've been tracking that quite closely. Um, and how Russia has been stoking the flames of transnational far-right extremism. Um, And so I'll talk a little bit about that um, as well. You know, some scholars have made the point that individuals traveling to fight for Ukraine um, and enlisting in the Ukrainian armed forces should be labeled as foreign volunteers, that we we should actually distinguish. Um, And and so um, those that travel to fight alongside militias, separatist, or terrorist groups should be more aptly categorized as, as foreign fighters. So I think, you know, once again, we find ourselves in this kind of definitional space where we're talking about, uh, you know, well, debating what we are talking about, right, to make sure that we're talking about the same unit of analysis. And, and I think, you know, foreigners to the battlefield are not all created equal. If you enlist through uh, the embassy, the uh, Ukrainian embassy in your country and go fight, that's a much different thing than if you're connecting with a neo-Nazi group online. 
uh, and showing up on the battlefield. Uh, those are the folks, I think, the latter that, that most European countries and other Western countries are concerned about. The numbers are staggering. And I think, you know, my, my advice on numbers would be to take them with a grain of salt. Um, Zelensky came out and said 16,000 foreign volunteers in the first two weeks. We then saw Ukraine's foreign ministry share an updated figure of 20,000. Um, but I think there's a lot of questions that remain regarding whether these numbers include members of the Ukrainian diaspora, right? And should those be counted as, as foreign fighters? I would argue no, if you're a Ukrainian living in the UK and you return home, are you really a foreign fighter? Um, or are we only talking about you know, foreign nationals, those that are actual you know, British citizens that are not part of the diaspora uh, or citizens from other European countries. So I think we're still very much parsing through the definitional phase of making sure we're comparing like with like, because if we're going to look at prior mobilizations, you know, we, we can't be lumping in diaspora fighters because we didn't do that in Syria. Right. And, and I think, you know, beyond just an academic exercise, it's important to, to be as accurate as possible when we're talking about these different categories uh, and these different typologies. Um, you know, many of the folks that we're now seeing going to fight and, and uh, flock to the Ukrainian side are inspired by Zelensky. They're inspired by Ukrainian nationalism. They are inspired by uh, what they see as defending the country against Putin uh, and, and an unprovoked Russian invasion. Um, I think, again, it's important to maintain some perspective here and to note that a very small proportion of the foreign volunteers so far are espousing far right views. Um, I think, you know, that's been a major sea change from 2014 on the Ukrainian side. They've worked uh, diligently to root that part of it out. That said, it still exists. It's still there. We need to keep that in perspective as well. But it's a smaller percentage of a larger mobilization. Um, I think, you know, one of the things Dan Byman has talked about before um, in, in some of his writings on foreign fighters, and he's, he's got a great book called Road Warriors. He says that the presence of right-wing extremists should give governments pause when they consider whether to encourage their nationals to go and fight. Uh, and so anytime you're encouraging people to go to a battlefield uh, where they may engage in violent activities, where they may witness violent activities, uh, where they may come home with post-traumatic stress disorder and all the other things we know that comes along with deploying to a war zone, uh, you're going to have to deal with the fallout, the second, third order consequences um, that, that come from that. Um, you've had members here in the United States of the so-called Boogaloo movement traveling over, uh, linking up with the Georgian Legion and, and others. Um, Casper mentioned reports of foreign volunteers growing frustrated uh, with the lack of weapons, ammunition, equipment. You know, we're living in an age of Instagram where people want to go to conflict zones and get selfies to increase their own street cred and, and followers. And it's a, it's a strange place. You've got a mix of really hardcore people uh, and, and some that are in way over their head. That said, governments you know, don't differentiate. They're gonna have to care for people uh, on, on all sides of, um, of that spectrum. Um, we can get into a lot of the specifics, I think, during um, Q&A. Happy to talk through any of these different kinds of categories um, because as we know, the Wagner Group, you know, it's another kind of non-state actor mercenaries, private military contractors are, uh, are also in the mix. Um, and I'd say that although the conflict, and, and, I'll, and I'll wrap up here, uh, between Russia and Ukraine is only weeks old, um, it's still essential that governments begin planning now, right? They need to be proactive and not reactive and start planning for the fallout and all the related challenges that result um, from whatever you want to call them, foreign fighters, volunteers, mercenaries, whoever's coming back. Uh, this is incredibly an incredibly complex battlefield. Uh, there's a whole range of different violent non-state actors. Um, they're all in the mix together. And then you've got disinformation being used to shape themes and narratives that emerge. Um, I think beyond that, looking kind of bigger picture, Russia's poor military performance is going to have profound implications on the global order. Um, and I think it's going to lead Putin to continue to lash out in unpredictable and in quite violent ways. Um, given that we've already seen war crimes committed, atrocities are mounting by the day. Um, you know, we're talking about a Russia that's going to remain a pariah state for the foreseeable future, uh, which is going to remain isolated and marginalized. Um, and we've seen in the past how the Russian state has mobilized aspects of this kind of uh, transnational far right to include foreign fighters um, in, in carrying out some of the Kremlin's own objectives. So let me stop there um, and, and turn it back to Tori. But 
again, happy to kind of get into any of the aspects of uh, the challenges here, the foreign fighter kind of picture, um, and whether, you know, these differences are, um, I think, are, are, or, or distinctions, uh, what they mean for states and for uh, law enforcement, intelligence agencies, counterterrorism practitioners, et cetera. Thank you. Well, well thank you, Colin. It's a, it's a really important subject you've raised. And before I let you go, I thought, let me just ask two follow-up questions to see if you might illuminate further. So you, you naturally move between talking about volunteers, mercenaries, foreign fighters, but also right-wing extremists. So I think to some extent, do you see a growing either um, idealism or ideology that could uh, develop in the case of Ukraine? I think you've written about this in the case of Chechnya, among other places where it shifted dramatically and your expertise on past cases might be helpful. The second and related question might be, for many of us who don't know how this works, I'm more aware of having worked on Syria issues in the Security Council, that there was efforts to try and reduce the financing to foreign fighters who are mainly seen as coming in uh, in a disorganized and potentially violent way on behalf of uh, extremists. And so I don't know if any of that architecture today on the financing has a role to play in the case here in Ukraine. And if we may be in a different world where governments that may have championed limits on foreign fighters in the past may shift and say, maybe that's not so bad. But anyway, those are two pretty big questions, but would love you if you could animate either aspect. Sure, sure. Um, well, I think the first, and, and you, you correctly, you, you referenced Chechnya, where we had what was initially um, you know, a nationalist cause and a separatist cause that over time, as uh, jihadi volunteers and foreign fighters showed up to the battlefield, changed in kind. Uh, the ideological nature of that conflict changed. It changed the level of violence, some of the atrocities that we've seen. Um, could that happen in Ukraine? It could. We, I think the, the, the important thing is we're a month in, right? Uh, some of these conflicts drag on for years. Uh, if you look at Syria, we're, we're now in what, year 11? So the things that we thought four weeks into the Syrian conflict, you know, we no longer think so much has happened between now and then. So you know, one of the things that I've written about um, and I wrote a, a piece with Noreen Fink in Politico a couple of weeks ago where we, we talked about the concern of Western volunteers that go and fight. Um, they engage in combat. They see some their, their, their friends and, and uh, fellow volunteers killed and, and maimed. And they think, why didn't the West do more? Why didn't my country do more to help? Whether that is a no-fly zone, you know, transferring MiGs, all these discussions of uh, that we're seeing play out now and, and all the kind of concern about escalation and, you know, w- w- would Vladimir Putin use nukes, right? A lot of that nuance gets lost on people that are so fired up that they're on the battlefield. They could very well return to their countries of origin with uh, a newfound anti-government extremism. We've seen it here in the United States. After Vietnam, uh, there was the so-called stab in the back myth where members of the military said the, the government, the politicians sold us out. We could have won that war. Uh, and, and they actually became the vanguard of many of the far right extremist groups here in the United States, including, you know, neo-Nazi and white supremacist groups. So that's a concern that I have that we could see things change uh, and play out over time. On the financing part, it, it's really interesting. And, and I think, you know, uh, unfortunately, and I was just having this conversation with Jess Davis recently talking about kind of the, 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 the landscape there. If you've got volunteers coming from Western countries to go fight uh, on the Ukrainian side, a lot of this is going to be self-financed and self-funded. And, you know, we see these things on Telegram and and other kind of social media sites where there's a kind of, just like we saw in Syria, hey, if you need to get to the battlefield or you need to get to to Poland and cross into Ukraine, here are all the things you need. Here's your checklist. I think on the Russian side, it's, it's far more interesting because now that the Russians have been hit with massive uh, sanctions, that's definitely going to impact a lot of what they do in this non-state actor space, whether it's through Wagner, whether it's through stoking the far-right extremism. That's the part that I'm very interested in and, and I'm going to be kind of digging on uh, over, over the coming weeks, particularly the, the Russian side. It's also, unfortunately, the side that's a lot uh, less transparent, right? And we have a lot less visibility on what's happening there. Um, and so it's going to take some sleuthing and, and some folks that are um, experts in this space, but you know we're going to be talking about this. Uh, I think for for the coming weeks, no question. 
Well, Colin, I think we've just gotten started with the depth of your knowledge. So thank you very much. Uh, and we'll be having you come back. But I'm going to turn next to an extremely well-known uh, observer and analyst of all things multilateral and specifically around the United Nations, which is Richard Gowan. He is the UN Director at International Crisis Group, or Crisis Group as it's more known today. And in that role, he oversees Crisis Group's advocacy work at the United Nations. He liaises with diplomats and UN officials in New York, and he will speak to the implication of Russia's invasion of Ukraine for the multilateral system. Uh, I think we will force him to answer everything from the impact on norms and architecture, uh, and also perhaps the role of the Security Council going forward. Um, but Richard, thank you for joining us. Uh, over to you. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Tori, um, and thank you to the Global Center for the invitation to this really interesting event. Um, I am going to change focus uh, from the issue of foreign fighters to the impact of this war on the multilateral system. But I'd actually like to sort of start where Colin left off, which is to emphasize that we are really at a very early stage of understanding the implications of the Ukrainian conflict for everything that we work on. Um, the last month has been probably the most intensive period of diplomacy uh, in the UN and especially in the Security Council uh, since the run-up to the Iraq war. We've had um, an astonishing number of uh, meetings on Ukraine uh, called by the US and its allies, and actually some meetings called by the Russians um, who have wanted to use the UN as a platform to spread disinformation about issues like supposed US bioweapons labs in Ukraine. Uh, the council has been meeting pretty much every other day um, on Ukraine, and uh, it has produced a lot of sound, it's produced a lot of fury, and it's achieved absolutely nothing in terms of responding to the conflict uh, for, the very <coughs> sorry, for the very simple reason that Russia has a veto and um, you know, has shot down uh, resolutions condemning its actions. But at the same time, we have seen the General Assembly uh, convene in some uh, really, quite, I mean, really quite heated diplomatic debates um, over the war. Uh, the uh, Assembly has passed two resolutions now condemning Russia, and um, the most recent yesterday. And if you switch attention to Geneva, the Human Rights Council has been active uh, on the war too, uh, mandating a commission of inquiry that will be able to track um, war crimes in Ukraine. Uh, although I don't believe that that commission of inquiry has actually yet gone into action. So there's been no shortage of uh, diplomatic activity, um, but once you sort of look beyond this initial rush, it's not entirely clear um, how the UN will be reshaped by a prolonged and presumably very deep um, collapse in trust between uh, Russia and the West. Um, one slightly surreal uh, element of diplomacy to date has been that uh, despite these multiple rolling arguments over Ukraine in the Security Council, the Russians and the West have managed to continue to conduct business as usual on a number of other files in New York. So since uh, the war began, we have seen the Security Council uh, renew the mandate for sanctions on Yemen. Uh, we have seen it renew the mandate for uh, peacekeeping in South Sudan. And I think most importantly, uh, we saw the council agree a, uh, a new mandate for the UN to remain in Afghanistan. Uh, since the fall of Kabul last August, there have been big questions about whether the UN should maintain a political presence in Afghanistan. Uh, that was a subject of very difficult diplomacy between the US, Russia, China, and other players like India prior to the beginning of the Ukrainian war. Um, we did wonder in early March whether the fallout from Ukraine would mean that that discussion of Afghanistan would fall apart, but it didn't. 
and in the middle of the month, uh, the council passed actually, I think, a rather sensible and rather good new mandate for the UN to stay on in Kabul, uh, monitoring human rights and acting as a liaison to the Taliban. So right now, it is proving possible to keep the UN going despite Ukraine, but we don't know how long that will last. There are a number of issues on the Security Council agenda where the toxins from Ukraine are pretty likely to make it impossible to do uh, normal diplomacy in New York. Um, those include discussions of humanitarian aid to Syria. Um, the Council has to renew a mandate for cross-border aid to Syria uh, in July. That's always been difficult with the Russians. It may now be impossible. Um, similarly, the Russians may have their eyes on uh, vetoing the mandates of some peacekeeping operations run by the European Union, such as uh, U4 Alfia, the long-standing um, EU mission in Bosnia, which the Russians have never really liked. And there are at least two places in Africa where you have significant numbers of UN peacekeepers um, alongside uh, Colin's friends in the Wagner Group. Um, those are the Central African Republic and Mali. And um, I think there's quite a high likelihood that Western powers and the Russians will really struggle to uh, continue any sort of constructive diplomacy over places where you have uh, UN peacekeepers and Russian mercenaries operating in the same space. So my bet is that we will see a series of blow ups on these issues at the UN in the coming year. But I do think there will remain some areas of continued cooperation, um, such as uh, over Afghanistan. And I think one important factor in that is China. Um, China is offering Russia some support at the UN, but it's also making it pretty clear that it's not entirely happy uh, with Russia's behavior. Um, it's abstaining on a lot of resolutions condemning Russia in different UN forums. And we know that behind the scenes, the Chinese have been lobbying the Russians to not let um, their feelings over Ukraine affect their decisions on issues like Afghanistan. And I think this will uh, also be relevant for discussions of peacekeeping in Africa, for example, because China has considerable interest in maintaining peace operations in some countries like uh, the DRC or South Sudan going. It has troops in some of those missions. And I think the Chinese will tell the Russians not to um, uh, complicate those missions too much. Uh, however, thematically, looking a bit further ahead, I think we certainly can see how this war will exacerbate existing uh, sources of pain in UN relations. Uh, you, Tori, have mentioned sanctions. Um, China and Russia have been on a pretty serious campaign over the last few years at the UN to delegitimize Western sanctions. They've argued that in places like Venezuela and Syria, it's actually US and EU sanctions that are hurting the population, rather than the behavior of the Maduro government or the Assad government. Um, if Russia remains under heavy sanctions, and especially if China gets hit by any sanctions related to this war, then Beijing and uh, Moscow will continue to push this anti-sanctions narrative, and it's a popular narrative. Countries like South Africa, Indonesia, India actually buy into the narrative. So that's one area where um, I think we will see Russia and China maintain a sort of ideological is not quite, quite the right word, but a conceptual offensive. Um, and in addition to all this, looking beyond the Security Council, uh, there is a massive crisis coming over humanitarian aid and development aid. The blunt fact is that um, the vast majority of ODA and humanitarian aid comes from European countries and the US. Um, that remains the case. China is still, for example, a negligible donor to organizations like the World Food Programme. Um, everyone understands that the UN system relies on this Western cash to run humanitarian and development operations. And everyone understands that this cash is going to run out because um, money is going to be repurposed uh, for Ukrainian refugees and for assistance in Ukraine. And so the big question that African diplomats here especially are asking is where will the money be for refugees in countries like Tanzania or the Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh? 
is all that money going to disappear? This is a source of extreme nervousness now around the UN system, especially given that uh, developing countries are also looking at um, food price shocks and um, other economic destabilizing factors. So if you zoom out from the Security Council, if you zoom out even from the Ukraine war proper, I think we're going to have a huge debate about um, the entire UN architecture for development aid and humanitarian aid, because um, there's going to be a resource shock for that complete sector. And that resource shock will have diplomatic implications, because if poorer developing countries suddenly don't see Western money coming um, through the UN system, then they will be looking to other sources of aid. And we know what that other source of aid is. Um, it's a big country uh, between um, Central Asia and the Pacific. Uh, you know, this is an opportunity for China actually to gain more leverage if there's a big drop in Western aid through the UN. So these are just some of the implications that I foresee. Um, but how they play out, just as Colin said about foreign fighters, um, we're still only in the very foothills of understanding. Richard, thank you very much. And, uh, you know, your point about the humanitarian crisis, it's already at the highest levels of displacement around the world since World War II prior to what we're seeing in Ukraine. So I think to, to underscore your point, that financial tension was there and it will be exacerbated. And uh, you can imagine the implications for funding also for other efforts, whether it's global development or climate change. Let me, if I might, turn to something that you maybe touched on a bit, but could go a little further on, which is the heart of the crisis groups work in great part is trying to bring peace and political negotiations and arguing for those negotiations, even if it's uncomfortable. And you've written on this and the potential outlines. Um, so even with the Security Council perhaps blocked from immediate action, you may be able to sense an outline of what nations are arguing about that could then lead to thinking through what negotiations that so far have not succeeded could come up with a peace agreement. So I'd like to ask you in part, where do you see a potential peace agreement heading? Do you see actors coalescing? Do you see the UN as a role in this or other actors? We've got countries that are not aligned with Russia directly, but nor did they vote for either a GA resolution or Security Council resolution who've been discussed as candidates and a lot of sort of capital, capital diplomacy. And then second, years ago and even more recently, you've been the go-to person to think about whether or not if there was a peace agreement, any kind of uh, peace operation, whether it's an observer mission or something stronger, which has been suggested now by the Pol Polish foreign ministry, or at least the president, I think. Um, which is not yet sketched out. Maybe that's the kind of instruments to be looked at. But let me just ask you broadly about that, the diplomatic options. Um, the sad reality is that actually New York is not a good place right now to really understand what the diplomatic options are. Um, there are two reasons for that. The first is Security Council paralysis. I. I unless there are conversations happening exceptionally quietly um, behind the scenes. Um, you know, the council is being used as a platform for political theatre um, and exchanges of accusations rather than diplomacy. Um, and secondly, Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General, um, so far has not, as we understand it, really found an entry point uh, to mediate in this conflict. And you know, the main reason for that is that um, he's paying the price for doing the right thing. Uh, the right thing that he did was um, call out Russia in pretty firm terms um, in the first weeks of the war, um, describing it as a, you know, a breach of international law and demanding that the war should stop. Uh, those are demands that he repeated in a press conference this week, marking the first month of the conflict. And the Russians uh, now hate him as a result. And um, the, uh, the, the Russians have been very publicly dismissive, both of Guterres, but also of um, some of his lieutenants, um, such as the Undersecretary General for Political Affairs, um, especially when uh, the UN doesn't go along with Russian narratives about bioweapons labs in Ukraine and so forth. So, you know, 
Guterres and his team are doing the right thing of telling the truth, which is something we, we like UN officials to do. Um, but because they're telling the truth, they're not being welcomed as sort of political interlocutors. In fairness, I think that more quietly, the UN is managing to talk to the Russians about humanitarian issues. There are UN officials embedded in the defense ministries in both uh, Moscow and Kiev. They are working on um, uh, aid convoys. There have now been some aid convoys run by the UN talking to the Russians. I think that's all good, although it does raise some concerns in the humanitarian sector that we're going to end up in a situation like Syria, where the Russians manipulate humanitarian aid. Um, looking further ahead, I think if a peace deal happens, it won't happen because of the UN. Um, it will probably happen because Israel or Turkey or one of the other countries that we know is involved in mediation somehow manages to uh, magic up a deal, or very frankly, the two sides exhaust themselves. Um, and, you know, we keep on being told that Russia will be exhausted in 10 days time. That seems to be a rolling 10 days, but there may come a point where the two sides uh, reach a mutually hurting stalemate, and you could get a peace agreement. Now, I think that in that scenario, just to end, there might just conceivably be a 20% chance of the UN having a role in running a peace operation. Not a big um, unprefer I-4 blue helmet military mission. That's out of the question. No one will take the risk of deploying the troops. Um, but you could imagine a UN uh, observer mission that went in to um, facilitate contacts between Russian and Ukrainian uh, forces uh, in terms of maintaining a ceasefire, dealing with un unintended incidents of violence, um, you know, checking that everyone is living up to their obligations under a ceasefire. That's actually something that I wrote about for Crisis Group uh, yesterday. I will put the link to that piece in the chat so everyone can, can see it. Um, I do think the UN could have a peacekeeping role, but the, that article is called A First Tentative Look at Options for a Peace Operation in Ukraine. It's the most caveated title I think I've ever used. Um, you know, we do understand that the key issue now is for, to get a peace agreement and then the peacekeeping will follow, if it follows at all. Yeah, well, thank you, Richard. It is one of the rules for uh, consensual peacekeeping that there be an underlying political agreement for them to function well. And uh, otherwise it's peace enforcement, which uh, rides over the um, uh, often protests of either the nation or the parties to the conflict. So thank you for clarifying that. Um, I will say, you know, even with all the shouting in the Security Council, we know that behind the scenes, one of the benefits is that there are quieter rooms and the shouting may continue, but it's also a place where even bilateral and multilateral uh, arguments can be hashed out and understand what are core interests from the countries. And, uh, you know, in contrast to Syria, the U.S. intervention in Iraq eventually led to a place where the U.N. could play a role. So thank you, as always, for your astute observations. Um, you always manage to be both strategic and up to the moment with what's going on. So I appreciate that. And you've well teed up our next speaker. Um, the question of sanctions, as well as the financial policies and even the role of crypto, is something that is a very live part of this conversation. And I'm delighted to introduce Liat Chitret, who's the Director of Regulatory Affairs and Compliance Policy at Solis Labs Labs, excuse me. Um, for over 15 years, she has led global capacity building and technical assistance programs on anti-money laundering, countering the financing of terrorism, financial inclusion, and countering violent extreme extremism. And many of you know her former role with the Global Center. So for many, uh, it's a welcome back. Really appreciate you joining us today and uh, I'd love to give you the floor. Thanks, Tori. Hello, everyone. And um, uh, thank you to the Global Center for inviting me to join this important conversation and for the center's ongoing leadership in the multilateral and global arena. Um, it, it's heartbreaking and crushing what we're seeing unfold in Ukraine and a wish for a peaceful um, and rapid resolution. So when sanctions against Russia were announced and first introduced, there was sort of an immediate backlash, an immediate call out and concern by regulatory agencies that cryptocurrencies um, will be used by Russia to evade sanctions sanctions, that um, they were imminently about to, you know, provide all the access that Russia would need to coordinate its entire economy. So, um, you know, Colin talked about non-state actors.
factors. And what I suggest to you this morning is that crypto assets are yet an additional non-monolithic state actor that we should be reckoning with and thinking about as another um, uh, actor that we need to really be focusing on strategically as part of the problem, but also part of the solution. Um, and I'll try and kind of make that case to you and share some, some perspective that, that I've been seeing from the crypto space. Um, first to say that much like cash or any other financial is instrument, um, crypto uh, across the variety of um, uh, currencies and tokens, NFTs um, can be used or be misused uh, uh, by any means. So it could be used for both licit and illicit purposes. And what we're really seeing in terms of a crypto bottom line is that crypto is helping both sides. It's helping Russia, it's helping Ukraine. And I'll elaborate a little, a little bit. So when it comes specifically to the question of is Russia able to utilize crypto for sanctions evasions, much like any other diplomatic response, the answer is yes and no. Russian entities are in individually able to use um, crypto to evade sanctions, to move their money. Um, however, the entire Russian economy by no means can be set upon crypto rails and crypto infrastructure. Um, so as a country, Russia is absolutely not able to use crypto altogether to, to continue its economic um, functionalities as, as it needs to. Um, but there are individual moments and instances and um, technical loopholes that it can um, uh, uh, utilize, whether at the entity level, at the individual level, at the oligarch level, in order to, to circumvent um, sanctions. But just very briefly, I'd like to step back um, and level set in terms of, you know, when I speak of cryptocurrencies, crypto assets, or digital assets, what I'm really referring to is um, a form of value or currency that um, exists virtually, digitally, and operates on a blockchain. I'm going to skip all the cryptographic secure transaction lingo and talk to you about the characteristics of crypto that are making this um, uh, a real issue for, for the, the Russian-Ukrainian situation. First of all, we, we see that crypto um, operates as it being um, decentralized. And, that, and what that means and the impact of that is that impact uh, is that crypto crosses borders quickly. Um, the speed is astounding. Bad, banks take over three days to settle transactions. Crypto is practically instantaneous. That means that the lifeline to Ukrainian, um, uh, so the Ukrainian government has been rapid and quick. Uh, we talk about crypto as also being politically decentralized, ideological free, and yet we're seeing the exact opposite um, situation occur, where we're seeing a war that's being crowdfunded by folks who are absolutely ideologically motivated to support um, at this point in time, the Ukrainian um, uh, uh, fundraising uh, that we're seeing. We also talk about crypto as being architecturally decentralized, which means that the computers operating in a global network um, don't offer a one-stop shutdown. You can't shut down the crypto operations that are ongoing. And all those characteristics make it quite favorable. Um, adding on to that, you know, it's, 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 it's trustless characteristic. You don't have to trust anybody. You don't have to trust a bank. We've seen previous conflicts where there has been a lot of concerns about putting your trust in a central bank or putting your trust into a particular um, uh, system. We, we've seen that, you know, that's the reason that Hawalas came about. Um, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, when it comes to crypto, it's a network that can operate and function without um, uh, trust at all. And finally, it's immutable. It's um, crypto cannot be changed and undone. When the transactions um, flow, essentially, they're recorded on the blockchain and they cannot be changed or altered. Now, what this means for us is that we have significant transparency into where money on crypto blockchains have come from and where they're going, whether they've been mined in Russia, whether they've been mined in Iran, in China or any other countries, we see the history of crypto and we know to interact with it based on a risk-based approach, which we know and love from the usual traditional financial system, we can assess crypto, um, risk score it, and provide it with its own mitigants if and when we see that crypto is coming from um, are wanting to be cashed out by a potentially sanctioned entity. So on the Ukrainian side, we've currently seen about $150 million that has been crowdfunded for Ukraine. Um, it's primarily being uh, sent to Ukraine DAO, which stands for a decentralized autonomous organization, essentially a Kickstarter campaign or a crowdfunding platform, as well as an unchained fund, which has raised over $7 million in cryptocurrencies. 
We see the aid um, supporting refugees and also supporting the purchase of weapons. Ukraine um, earlier this month uh, went ahead and legalized crypto payments as a legal tender in the country to make sure that there is legal coverage um, for payments to be received. Uh, many of the crypto uh, donations are going directly to the wallets held by the Ukrainian governments, allowing it to spend and be managed under the Min Ministry of Digital Transformation. This is um, revolutionary warfare. You've got ideological um, crowdfunding of war. This is massive. Uh, we're seeing also that um, on the Russian side, uh, the main concern is that Russia has had existing ties to crypto-linked cybercrime sites, darknet sites, the likes of Hydra, um, which is you know, a, a darknet market for purchase of um, illicit goods and services, fake IDs, fake credit cards, um, uh, allowing folks to circumvent know your customer uh, 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 rules, um, which could aid in potentially sanctions evasions. Um, what we're also seeing with, with regards to Russia is that um, they do have a significant hacking and ransomware uh, capability pre-existing this um, situation. They must have anticipated that sanctions will come their way. Um, so, so, you know, the anticipation is to look towards an uptick in ransomware uh, attacks from Russia. And, and I think on the sidelines, you know, we've briefly mentioned China. Um, China is watching, China is learning. And um, there's a situation um, uh, also with Taiwan that Taiwan is likewise watching and learning. We've seen China over the years hardwire itself across Africa. Um, and, and, and this has massive uh, implications, I would argue a national security concern when it comes to crypto. China has already rolled out its um, central bank digital currency which um, which is essentially its digital um, uh, 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 dollar, so to speak. Um, the U.S. does not have one, but we've seen that the implication of, of this has been that many countries around the world are now fast-tracking the development of their own central bank digital currency um, in order to, to tackle questions related to the, the dominance of the digital dollar um, or the dollar generally, the dominance of the dollar. Um, the, the few things that I would maybe put out there is that Governments right now, um, uh, US, G G7, G20, so on, the UN, um, crypto is another tool in the toolbox for governments and, and, and it has massive applications and opportunities in the distribution of aid, in um, the, the mitigants that we discussed around the humanitarian and development aid shock that's coming. Um, crypto can support and help manage and mitigate a lot of these shocks that we're seeing. I think that um, you know, if, if, if I were running a government at this point in time, I'd be investing in crypto rails um, to make sure that I had a plan B to um, you know, that country that we've been talking about uh, and, and, and to provide an alternative. There's new cash and new money in there and crypto is absolutely a foreign policy tool. What this also means is extensive public-private partnerships we're seeing stepping up to support Ukrainian um, uh, 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 funds management or a variety of um, private crypto exchanges and crypto companies that are able to um, partner up very rapidly with, with governments in order to help um, make sense out of the, the, the steep learning curve that comes with crypto, but it's happening and it's, it's working. And I think this is a really big um, uh, turning point that, that we're seeing um, I think that we, we also, you know, we're seeing a testing opportunity here. Uh, uh, I know that some entities in the UN, for example, UNICEF are already using uh, blockchain and um, uh, are distributing uh, small loans and small funds um, through crypto. And, and there's a real opportunity to, to reimagine the way that we can um, focus on, on, on financing. So um, I can talk on and on and on, but I'm going to stop right there because I know we have a great discussion upcoming, but I hope I've provided um, a few uh, areas of, of interest for folks. And there's a lot of inter uh, discussions that we can be having here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you are definitely taking us to a place where your expertise shines because many of us are still trying to understand how this whole world of crypto and financial tools works. If, if you don't mind, let me draw you out on two points. You, you mentioned how this could be the first sort of crowdsourcing uh, war or conflict, first crypto war. And you mentioned briefly that people wanna send money to Ukraine and it was going both to arms and potentially humanitarian aid. What is the, if you know, the governance mechanisms around that? Uh, you reeled off the name of the groups that got it, but like, it didn't sound like the Red Cross to me. So could you talk a little bit about you know, if um, I want to send off money through this mechanism, what are my choices? And on the other end, how we are thinking about governance, both for Ukraine, but also more internationally. And then a second quick point, 
uh, there was a flurry of suddenly people trying to understand a lot more about what the SWIFT platform meant and how it worked. And I don't know if you would be able to just briefly comment on how big a deal or not that is, and if it's reversible in that if we get Richard's peace agreement, um, you know, is that something that you can see countries kind of going back to so-called normal? Thank you. Thank you. So not loaded questions at all. Let me try and tackle um, tackle those. Uh, so so just on the first one with regards to governance and, and crowdsourcing. So Zelensky has been extremely proactive in uh, putting forward a, a Ukrainian vetted address on Twitter and otherwise um, for contributions. And so um, all the contributions that have been pouring in um, have been at the back end sort of being centralized by the Ukrainian governments and all of the all of the contributions are going to the Ukrainian government's wallets that are managed and um, dispersed uh, by Zelensky. I think, um, you know, if you look at the wallet addresses that have been posted, what's unique about them initially is that um, the requests for donations have been um, uh, asked uh, to be uh, brought in by Bitcoin and Ether specifically, which are two specific coins. What's unique about both Bitcoin and Ether is that they are trackable on the blockchain. So um, when you talk about governance, um, that element of you know, passing around $100 between all of us and not knowing where it ends up, that can't happen with Bitcoin and Ether because um, uh, at any moment, there is um, a, a capability of, of tracking, overseeing any movement at the tiniest amount of funds from those wallets, where they're going to, who they're being dispersed to, and um, that's connected um, pseudo anonymously, so not fully anonymously, but you can track and see where the funds are being dispersed to and what it's being used for. And I think that that governance mechanism, although hasn't been you know completely codified and enshrined and standard operating procedures and all of this, but but that's the fundamental difference when it comes to to using crypto. Um, you know, just as an example, when the Twitter hack happened um, uh, last year, and uh, within seven days, law enforcement were able to track down all of the funds that were being used and bring them back and recover those funds, because they had a, a bit, basically a visual map of where the money was going, even when there were attempts to obscure and blur the lines by, by conducting a variety of money laundering and terrorism financing kind of um, strategies that you can use uh, online. But blockchain analytics companies are really aiming to, um, to give clarity to that. And that doesn't exist elsewhere. So, so um, there's a lot more that can be done and should be done around governance. But from a tech perspective, um, it's possible. Now we're sort of waiting for the regulatory and um, you know other other folks to to catch up so that we can have that that, that governance conversation. When it comes to SWIFT, um, so the importance of, of, of SWIFT is really it's it's the global messaging system in which we wire funds and and communicate globally. Unplugging Russia from SWIFT was essentially meant to give it a rapid shock of um, uh, pulling away the plug from its access to global banking, correspondent banking relationship relationships and although there's no crystal ball or any you know way to predict certainty by how that would happen um crypto obviously was unable to take on any sort of um amount that uh that that the russian banks um had suffered there was no way that um that the crypto could step in in place of uh, of swift and, and and support the the potential sanctions evasions that people were talking about what it did do however is to create pressure points on what we call cash out points or or off-ramp points when um large crypto exchanges would need to essentially offer cash out services for people who are looking to move their money in and out um, of Russia or uh, by Russian sanctioned entities. And so what we what we saw is that crypto exchanges who, who operate like money service businesses really needed to um, quickly strengthen up their, um, their, their sanctions compliance and to put in place um, uh, technical escrow capabilities. So within crypto, unlike banks, there's no mechanism for you to block the receiving of money. If I send you money, your wallet has to accept it technically. So if I'm receiving sanctioned funds, I have no way to avoid it. I automatically get it, which means I'm potentially violating sanctions. The crypto workaround technically is an escrow account that a crypto exchange can say, hey, wait a minute, those are that's money that I have to accept, but I'm not going to use it. I'm not going to allow anybody else to cash out on these funds. I'm putting them in this escrow account. I'm reporting it as a suspicious activity um, to my regulator, and that money is not going to be cashed out. So what we're going to see 
is a growing of escrow holds within crypto exchanges and crypto businesses of those potentially sanctioned funds or, or um, that they can't move. And I, th I think what we're going to see is pressure now um, on, on what China is going to do with its digital currency. You know, um, Russia has developed its own digital currency, but we've seen its digital ruble, but we've seen that it's very introspective. It's only giving it very limited internal functionalities. It has no way to interlink externally or provide it with, with sort of back end financial support. And I think, you know, from my perspective, I don't sleep at night waiting to see what China does in terms of supporting with, with potential digital asset um, support, but that's a whole other story. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, your insights are, are wonderful and very, very helpful for this discussion. Um, we've had a wonderful panel presentation, and I'm going to turn now towards our open discussion and our Q&A. Many of you have already started putting in questions uh, in the chat function. And if you've asked to join in an intervention, I look for the moderator to reach out to you directly. Um, if I turn to you, we'll ask all of our interventions to be two minutes or less, please. Um, and also I'll ask you to introduce yourself. Uh, so again, please put your questions in the chat or do the raise hand function uh, and one of my colleagues will come find you. But for the moment, I, um, I see roughly three people in the queue who will be joining us, I think on screen. Um, I don't have all your full bios, but I think it's, uh, Alan Ancion, Paul Brennan, and Megan Corredo. Are you with us? I am. Okay. Hello, this is this is Alain Ancion. If I if I'm allowed, um, thank you for this opportunity and thank you for providing such a very rich set of presentations uh, by excellent speakers. I'm a little bit ashamed to appear so casually, but here in Sarajevo uh, in the afternoon, it's quite warm. So um, I hope you bear with me. Um, I had a quite general question, which I'm almost ashamed of now that I heard such um, very specific presentations. But the question was, uh, what impact will the Russian aggression in Ukraine have on the neighboring Western Balkans, where nationalism, denial of genocide, historic revisionism, and border disputes are major issues and Russia is playing a negative role. So this is more geopolitical, but I'll make use immediately of the granted two minutes. So I will uh, specify that um, because I was triggered by the presentation also of Mr. Clark um, and uh, foreign terrorist fighters is something that I'm dealing with. I'm, by the way, the regional security coordinator for uh, the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Western Balkans, dealing with counterterrorism and countering violent extremism. Um, the foreign fighters, as you probably know, uh, that have come from the Western Balkans, um, that have come back to the Western Balkans, are dealt with very differently. Um, the people that come back from Syria get long jail sentences. The people have come back from Ukraine in both Bosnia and especially Serbia get a platform on national television to share their heroic stories. Um, and you see them appear now in the pro-Russian demonstrations that you see um, become more regular here in the region. So my question would be, um, do you see um, uh, an additional uh, worry or an additional threat from people that are already joining now also the pro-Russian side? Um, and, and, and what do you think maybe of my more general question on the impact that the current aggression is having on an unstable region with a lot of sensitivities. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Those are actually fantastic questions. Um, I'm going to turn to one more person. If Megan is with us, I understand your hand is up. And then I uh, will either take one more or I'll go to the panel. Megan, can you hear me? All right, um, we had one other person requesting um, to join in. I don't know if Paul, you can hear me and you'd like to ask your question of the panel. All right, well, why don't we sort out who wants to ask questions, but I think Alan has posed two very meaty uh, conversations. And I'd like to, if we could go back to the full panel uh, but particularly maybe kick off 
uh, either Richard or Colin. Colin, I think the foreign fighter question was a bit headed your way. And Richard, maybe that gives you a moment to think about the larger consequences. But Colin, would you like to, to comment on that? Sure. Yeah, uh, yeah, I would. And I, and I think it's an excellent question and certainly no, nothing to be uh, ashamed about of asking. I mean, these are very poignant questions. Um, look, anytime you have conflict, there's going to be destabilizing effects. There's going to be second and third order impacts that we're not uh, prepared for. I'll tell you what, what caught my eye was a piece in The Guardian maybe a couple of weeks ago by Chris Chibis, who I used to work with at the RAND Corporation. Chris was then the, the national intelligence officer for Europe, um, and so really knows these issues in and out. One thing that he mused about openly was, if this conflict drags on, will the Russians send you know, either Wagner folks other extremists into Europe to conduct sabotage uh, operations and terrorist attacks on European soil. They haven't shied away from assassinating dissidents in the UK and Germany. Uh, and so I don't think this would be beyond the pale at all for, for Russia. And I think we could end up seeing uh, you know, some really destabilizing effects if you have attacks in you know, the south of France or Berlin or you know, other places. That, that, that would be a game changer in my opinion. Um, the other thing that Putin is doing is he's using refugees as a weapon. I mean, he's deliberately sending in floods of uh, refugees and displacing people internally within Ukraine because he knows that Western nations are going to have to deal with that fallout. And so the more we're focused our, our time, energy and resources on dealing with the humanitarian aspects, the less we'll have to focus on the conflict. I mean, that's just um, you know, the fact of the matter. So I think, you know, and then, uh, as you mentioned, Elaine, uh, you're still dealing with the fallout in the Western Balkans from mobilizations that took place years ago. It's going to be the same thing with this conflict. Uh, these issues don't go away. Um, governments often adopt the kick the can down the road approach, unfortunately, because they are very complex problems that require intensive resourcing. Uh, and so they do lead to these kind of second order impacts that, uh, as you rightly well know, <laughs> you're dealing with it from a policy level. Uh, and, and so um, a whole bunch of things that I think we're not expecting um, that are, that are going to result, unfortunately. Thank you very much, Colin. That's extremely helpful. Richard, may I turn to you next? Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I touched on this very briefly in my initial remarks, but uh, there is a UN dimension to this because um, uh, as, as I'm sure you will recall sitting in Sarajevo, um, there was a bit of a crisis uh, last fall um, when Russia threatened to veto the continue, continuation of the mandate for U4 Althea um, in Bosnia, um, primarily because of a dispute with the West over the office of the high representative. And um, again, sitting in Sarajevo, you know the backstory to this, but um, Russia and actually China um, have uh, basically turned against OHR and see it as a Western tool. Um, now, last last fall, it was possible to avoid the Russian veto of U4 Althea, but I think if we look at sort of the list of potential flashpoints in the Security Council that will be affected by what's going on in Ukraine, um, you know, the renewal of that mandate is one of the most vulnerable um, points, and so you could well imagine. Um, you know, assuming this crisis is dragging on, even if hopefully the active hostilities are over um, by the second half of this year, that Russia would announce that it would veto um, uh, veto U4 on principle. It might also veto, by the way, the continuating continuing mandate for Operation Irini, which is the uh, EU naval mission um, off the coast of Libya. Uh, now, my... Uh, some friends at the European Council on Foreign Relations wrote a good piece about this. I'm putting it in the chat. Uh, it's, it's called Council of War, um, and it looks at uh, Russia's potential vetoes over Bosnia and Syria. Um, they point out that if you read the Dayton agreements, uh, there probably is a legal case for maintaining uh, 
some sort of uh, NATO or EU force in Bosnia, even without a Security Council mandate. But clearly, if um, you had a situation where Russia refused to support the force in the Security Council um, and Western countries attempted to keep the peacekeepers in place, uh, that could well have serious repercussions um, uh, in terms of dealings with Republika Srpska and also potentially with Belgrade. So exactly how this will play out, we're not sure, but I, I do worry that um, Russia has a, a very clear pathway to causing trouble uh, for you and your colleagues in Bosnia through the Security Council. But the, the only good news is that that mandate isn't up for renewal until November. And, um, uh, you know, a lot is going to happen between, between now and then. Fantastic. Um, Alan, thank you very much. I think your question really did spark some, some additional insights and some really good points. So thank you. Um, I want to turn to someone else from our audience. Um, I see uh, Atena Makona. I mispronounced your name. I apologize. Welcome to the discussion. I, uh, over to you to introduce yourself and to pose your, your comment question. Uh, thank you very much, actually. I, I really enjoyed uh, the conversation. I'm sorry, we've lost you briefly. Especially the narratives from uh, long time but I, I just want to uh, by the way my name is Amanda. yes uh, by the uh, I am an uh, uh, anti-money laundering uh, consultant in East Africa uh, just just to introduce myself I have some three questions they are all related especially I want to mention to Mr. Richard uh, my first question is that uh, the current conflict the current invasion of Russia, on Ukraine, do you think that it's going to change the world ignore? Do you think that it's going to make UN uh, irrelevant and uh, encourage some big countries to undertake invasion on smaller countries in the context of uh, national security? For example, China against Taiwan or Hong Kong, you know, Egypt against Ethiopia, you, you know, we have. Uh, conflict on the Nile River, Egypt. So do you think it will, uh, this will change? That's my first question. The second one is, do you think the US uh, policy against between Ukraine and uh, Russia? I mean, for me, the Cold War was never over. We, 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 we see a very hateful exchanges between the US and uh, Russia over time. We saw a very uh, pit pat for a long time. And uh, I mean, uh, does, it, that, does this make Russia insecure? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, do you think that the US should change uh, the policy? It's a nuclear uh, power country. And do you think uh, the US policy uh, uh, contributed? My final question is that, uh, I mean, the Ukraine resistance, it's very incredible. We try to follow up the news on the uh, sky and other issues. Very, very incredible. So what's going, what do you think will be the outcome? I mean, uh, I don't think that uh, Russia at any cost wants to win this war, right? And do you think uh, more destruction on Ukraine? Do you think there will be uh, nuclear conflict and uh, uh, third world war. What, what, what do you see of the future in this area? Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Those are three very important and very large questions. Uh, I'm going to turn to Liat in a moment here. I don't expect every panel member to answer all three, but um, uh, I will give you the chance to answer which ones you like. Over to you first, but then Richard and Colin, I will turn to you next. Sorry, I had trouble hearing um, the question. Why don't I repeat the question? Thank you. So, Sorry. For all of us, if I, I hope I got this correctly. But first, given the tensions around this conflict, 
Could we see a renewal of tensions in other areas where the UN is not able to step in? I think in a way he was asking, is the UN irrelevant? And noted, say, the tensions between Egypt um, uh, and Ethiopia, for example, or China um, and Taiwan. I may not have gotten all those examples exact, but the idea of the tensions rising and the UN no longer sort of playing a, a moderating role. Um, and, and second, what is, you know, is Russia's interests here? If I got that correctly, um, where does this go? And, and how is this resolved? Um, that may be a question actually for you as well, the pullback question. Um, and then do they wanna win? And what are the repercussions? Um, I'm sorry if I didn't get all three of your questions correctly, but I think you were asking me the three biggest questions we have really about this conflict. I'll make a brief um, contribution to this, which is to say that um, if the UN does not innovate, in my perspective, if, if we do not embrace uh, the, the ways in which technology can help us do peacekeeping better, could help us do um, uh, you know, financing, aid disbursement, development, uh, humanitarian, refugee support, all the things that you know, are bread and butter UN elements, if we don't innovate around that and find better ways to um, tackle uh, endemic um, corruption, siphoning of aid funds. We're just going to end up with, you know, Syria too, and everything, any other sort of um, uh, scenario that we've seen before. And we really have an opportunity to work with a robust uh, private sector that really wants to help. Um, there's there's cash being poured in all over the place from venture capitalist funds um, onwards to to crypto businesses that really are also looking for opportunities for social corporate responsibility and support for partnerships and um, and and so on. So I think there's a really important opportunity for the UN to innovate. Um, I'll spare you my uh, my opinion on what I think Putin is trying to do. I don't think I'm an expert by any means. It would just be my my personal opinion. So I'm going to skip that one, Antenna. But great to see you. Um, and I'll turn over to to others. All right, well, thank you. I think it's tantalizing enough to hear a slightly optimistic note that if the UN can uh, sort of take advantage of the moment and modernize, it might have some additional tools that it could make use of. Um, uh, Colin, would you like to come next? Yeah, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just weigh in very briefly because you know, you're right, Tori, these are big questions that probably deserve their own webinar you know, altogether. I think, you know, in, in my take, and again, I'm not a, I'm not a Russia expert. I don't want to pass myself off as one, but I've been following, you know, this, this issue closely. Uh, I think, you know, Putin felt emboldened by previous incursions, and he thought that Ukraine was going to look a lot like Georgia in 2008, which was essentially a two-week military invasion, in and out, achieving their objectives with a slap on the wrist from the international community. He gambled and he lost in terms of and, and Lavrov has admitted it much. They were not expecting these full-throated, unified Western sanctions uh, in, to be as comprehensive. You know, look at Germany. <laughs> Germany, you know, shelved Nord Stream 2 and then committed $100 billion with a B dollar, euros to spend on defense by the end of the year. So, you know, th this invasion backfired in almost every way possible. The Russians are losing massive numbers of troops you know, as many as 10,000, if not more, totally demoralizing. Uh, they've exposed themselves as a second rate military. Uh, this is not the, the, you know, great power that many have talked about. I think it's a gas station with nukes. Uh, you know, the Russians don't deserve to be in the great power conversation. They're not a great power. Um, you know, and then would, you know, I think there was a question there, would Putin use nukes? The fact that we're even having this conversation is, is you know, chilling. Uh, and I think, you know, there are great experts out there like Fiona Hill, who had an interview in Politico where she said, yeah, I think he would. When if backed into a corner with no other options, I think he would resort to nuclear weapons. So I'll defer to experts like Fiona Hill. But again, just the fact that we're having these conversations and they're serious tells you everything you need to know about what the Russians have done under Putin. Um, you know, this has been a debacle in, in every sense. Thanks very much, Colin. That's helpful. Uh, Richard, do you want to join in on this part of the discussion? Sure. Um, I mean, so three three points. I mean, I think the the first question uh, it wasn't just about sort of the UN as a uh, an organization. Um, 
although I would say that I actually think that UN institutional reform probably gets harder, frankly, now um, that rather than easier. But um, it was also around sort of the basic norms of the UN Charter, because um, this is a pretty rare thing um, by post-war standards, which is a classic interstate war. Um, not an internationalized civil war, not some sort of funky hybrid operation, but a, you know, classic one country invades another um, sort of thing. And, uh, you know, for most of our professional lives, the last 30 years, interstate war has been incredibly rare. Um, you know, we did see Nagorno-Karabakh in, I guess, late 2020. Uh, and I think the guys who do conflict data at Uppsala pointed out that you know, that raised the number of interstate wars in the world to two, which was a record for the post-Cold War era. You know, they have been incredibly rare. Um, will we now see a, a return to interstate war as a normal policy tool? And there are some disturbing signs, you know, specifically in Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, uh, the Russian peacekeepers there are obviously rather distracted, and it does look like... Um, Azerbaijan and Armenia are testing each other again. So we could actually have another war in the post-Soviet space kicking off. Um, this is something my colleagues in the Caucasus have been uh, flagging in the last couple of days. And more generally, you know, I, 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 I simply, I simply think it's too early to predict. Um, I mean, I don't think the chances of Ethiopia and Egypt going to war over the uh, Ethiopian uh, dam project sort of are massively increased or decreased um, by what's going on in Ukraine. Um, uh, but it certainly means that you know, international diplomatic attention to what's going on between Sudan, Ethiopia and um, uh, Egypt uh, is reduced and that means that if uh, there were steps miscalculations or deliberate calculations towards war in east africa then you know washington would not be seized of that i think in quite the same way that it was seized of the situation in ethiopia with with tigray last year so i mean you know it does you know when when you're distracted by one major major sort of conflict clearly you're going to sort of have less of a focus on others um, in terms of Russia's security perceptions, um, I think I think it was difficult to to hear you, but I think you were saying, did NATO expansion create a sense of insecurity in Russia? Um, and I think the answer to that is obviously yes. And that wasn't just in Mr. Putin's head. Um, but the point I would make is that in January this year, um, you know, the US and its allies offered Russia a, a genuine security dialogue about European security. Now, with a lot of red lines, but nonetheless, in a way that, um, you know, the West hadn't been willing to talk to Russia for quite a long time. And if Mr. Putin had been solely concerned with attempting to uh, redesign the OSCE and other aspects of the security architecture in Europe, he could have taken that dialogue and he could have um, uh, entered a diplomatic process that would have delivered, you know, probably some of what he wanted. Um, Instead, he invaded Ukraine. And if you listen to his speeches when, you know, when he was in the first stage of the invasion, uh, this was not a man who was primarily concerned with the OSCE reform. This, this was, uh, or, or the return of the Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty. Something much more deep, deep and primal in his view of Ukraine was, was driving him on. Although, as Colin said, I think he also just expected a, a quick win. Uh, lastly, are we all going to die? Um, this is a good question. I find it quite interesting. Um, I would say, uh, well, firstly, yes, but I mean, I guess are we all going to die in sort of roughly the same couple of hours? Um, look, I, I think that I agree with Colin. Um, we should be very concerned that this is a conversation at all. I think the sort of nuclear, the nuclear theologists have differing views over how um, serious the, the threat is at the present time. Um, but what I would say is that what we should take away from the fact that this is a is a threat at all is that yet yeah, pressure is great and um that the level of pressure on putin is uh, remarkable 
but we do also have to think about frameworks for de-escalation. And um, you know, thinking about frameworks for de-escalation uh, involves diplomacy. It might, as we said, involve peacekeeping. Um, it will have to involve some sort of uh, you know compromises around Crimea and so forth. It is possible to both apply pressure and talk about de-escalation at the same time. I am a little worried that at the moment, everyone in Brussels and Washington and so forth is sort of high on um, just piling more pressure on Russia. But we do, we do still have to talk about the frameworks for de-escalation in parallel with that, because otherwise, in a best case scenario, this just turns into a, a longer war in which a lot of Ukrainians die. Um, and you know, that's something that we, we just want to stop. Thank you, Richard, and uh, thank you for also repeating what you heard our questioner ask. And I, I think there was some nuance there. It was good to have you capture. And I, I will also note your point, which is maybe the council's blocked, um, but the ferociousness of the response in a way you were framing it around the norms matters. It is in our, for many of us in our professional lives, one of the very rare times when one country has invaded another. And a uh, personal observation for me is just with Russia sitting on the Security Council, they had every tool available to them if they really felt that either there was development of a nuclear capability or abuse of a Russian speaking population or a disagreement over a border peace. And uh, to not use make use fully of all those mechanisms is also a bit stunning. Um, all right, I'm excited. We're gonna turn now to two more interventions and I'll ask uh, both Anna and then Tracy to briefly introduce themselves and pose their question to the panel. Um, Anna, you're up first, please, welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Anna Oserink and, and I am head of UN at Article 19, which is a global human rights organization defending free speech. Thank you so much for organizing this timely discussion and it's it's been very interesting. Um, I have a question for Richard, but possibly also other panelists. So I, I don't want to discriminate in that sense, but I think he will have some thoughts. Um, there have been discussions to evict Russia from certain multilateral fora, including the Security Council, the General Assembly, and the Human Rights Council. And for example, my own organization called for Russia suspension from its elected membership of the Human Rights Council, because we felt it's really hard to rhyme aggression this type of aggression and the commission of war crimes with sitting on uh, and voting in the main human rights uh, body within the UN. However, there are other international experts, including the Special Rapporteur on protecting human rights while countering terrorism that argue that this will risk turning Russia into even more of a pariah state and will decrease opportunities for the very needed diplomatic engagement uh, in particular, considering we are dealing with a nuclear power, and this, these are my words, a potentially unhinged leader. Do you think eviction is advised? And then would that be from the Security Council, or are you thinking other fora, such as the Human Rights Council? How would that impact the solution for peace in Ukraine, or the seeking for a solution for peace in Ukraine in particular? And then maybe also some of these more broader questions that you mentioned, which I thought was very interesting, the potential spillover in terms of peacekeeping operations and other discussions on the, on, the, on the agenda. And then I had one final specific question, picking up on what was said on UN reform and how it's become harder. Um, and a particular question on Security Council reform, is there any point in pursuing the reform of veto power? Um, I, I know that uh, some have been suggesting that obviously Russia has been abusing that in terms of deflecting uh, and, and, and defending their own position, but I'm wondering if even the other P5 would be open to any thoughts of reform of the veto power. I'm just going to focus on that particular one, but bigger Security Council reform in terms of membership, any thoughts there? Are welcome as well. And just to thank you all, uh, the Global Center for organizing um, and looking forward to engaging with all of you uh, in the next few months on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Those are very thoughtful questions. Appreciate you posing them. Before I turn back to the panel though, I'd like to go to Tracy. Tracy, if you could introduce yourself. Thank you. My name is Tracy Derner. I'm Director of Financial Integrity and Inclusion at the Global Center. Um, I wanted to pick up on something that Leah mentioned about well, two things really. 
Firstly, about how kind of the crypto ecosystem was not quite ready to fully absorb the full force of the Russian economy, and therefore didn't really undercut sanctions measures quite as widespread as some had been concerned, although, of course, that was different a bit at the individual level. So my question is, is that a matter of the crypto ecosystem not being ready yet? And if so, what does that mean for the future of sanctions measures and kind of other multilateral efforts to use financial tools as a foreign policy tool? Um, particularly noting some of the opportunities you mentioned about the transparency in the blockchain system. And then my second kind of question is, I was really struck by kind of the huge positive force that crypto has been for Ukraine and, and the point that you made about this being a revolutionary, almost kind of crowdsourced war. Um, what can and maybe is already being done to consider what a more robust crypto, crypto ecosystem would mean for that type of crowdsourced war in the future? So kind of, in other words, what should we be thinking about now with an eye towards the next crypto war and what that might look like? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I may go first to Richard for the questions around the different UN bodies and the role of Russia on and off and also the use of the veto. And then Leah, if you don't mind, I'll turn to you on, the, on our last question. And Colin, happy to also uh, get your opinions on, as a third speaker here. But Richard, over to you. Okay, I mean, ways to penalize Russia. Um, I think we've all been penalized uh, because we've had to read the bits of the UN Charter we always ignored before to find the answers to this. Um, but here we go. Uh, can you throw Russia um, out of the UN or out of the Security Council? No. Um, the reason for that is that Article 5 of the Charter allows for the suspension of countries. Article 6 allows for the expulsion of countries from the UN. But in both cases, that has to be on the recommendation of the Security Council. Um, and there is one precedent from, I think, the 70s when there was an effort to um, throw apartheid South Africa off the Security Council, but it was blocked by P5 vetoes. The precedent is the recommendation of the Security Council on membership is a substantive um, issue where the veto applies. Russia has a veto, so it can stop itself being thrown out of the UN. And it's, you know, it is said that actually that is quite deliberate. Um, Russia was expelled from the League of Nations um, for the invasion of Finland. And so when uh, the UN Charter was being negotiated, the Russians were very keen to ensure that they, they would not be thrown out by the Americans at some future date. So those forms of expulsion are not possible. Two, there is a theory um, espoused by Ukraine that Russia did not legitimately inherit the Soviet seat at the UN um, at the end of uh, well, at the end of the Soviet Union. And because the, the UN Charter refers to the USSR being a permanent member of the Council, not Russia, Ukraine has argued um, that uh, it should at least be denied its seat um, at the horseshoe table. This again just doesn't work. Um, Ukraine was one of a number of countries that uh, signed a statement in, I think, 91, um, a num number of post-Soviet states, recognizing that Russia was the successor state at the UN um, to the Soviet Union. And also 30 years of diplomatic practice does actually matter. And you know, Russia has been consistently recognized as being the holder of the seat. Frankly, I think throwing Russia out of the Security Council would also be um, highly satisfying, but politically unwise. I think the idea of um, you know, pushing revisionist states out of multilateral organizations um, is probably more dangerous than, than useful because once they're on the outside, um, you know, there's even less restraint on, on how they behave. The idea of expulsion from the Human Rights Council or suspension from the Human Rights Council, though, I think is interesting. And I think after yesterday's General Assembly vote, where you had a clear two thirds of countries um, again supporting Ukraine and condemning Russia, you will now see a push um, to uh, to action the mechanisms um, for suspension from the Human Rights Council, which, as you know, requires a two thirds majority of countries in the Human Rights Council and in the General Assembly um, uh, voting for suspension. I think this is a feasible diplomatic slap at Russia. 
but I would still be a little careful about um, supposing that all the countries that have signed on to the resolutions we've seen so far would actually back this more concrete step against the Russians. And it's worth remembering that for a lot of countries, this creates some precedent. You know, if you can throw, if you can suspend Russia from the Human Rights Council, um, uh, you know, who's, who's going to be next in line for suspension? This does raise a level of concern that more general condemnations do not raise. Um, and I also think it's important to say that you would, you would need a really solid majority for this just in political terms. Um, I have heard some people say, well, you know, a lot of countries would abstain. The abstentions don't actually count when you're counting the votes. Um, so, you know, maybe we could get away with it. You need a, you need a big real majority of countries to um, make this politically feasible. And on that last note, I would say that all the, all the penalizing discussions are fun and important. Um, but they have to be paralleled with efforts to actually maintain a positive coalition of support for Ukraine at the UN. And so I think the next step that the West should take is actually to table a General Assembly resolution talking about the global effects of this war. And I think actually it would be great if Ukraine would table a global resolution um, about the need uh, for an international response to the food price shocks that are coming. Because there is already a narrative here that there are going to be food price shocks because of Western sanctions on Russia. And therefore, it's actually the West that is at fault. Um, no, there are going to, there's going to be food price shocks because Russia invaded Ukraine. And it's jolly hard for Ukraine to, inv um, to export its wheat when its railway lines are being bombed. And I think that Ukra Ukraine needs to sort of tell the rest of the world that actually it's, you know, it's, it's Putin's war and it's Putin's food price shock. And I think you need to have some of that narrative to keep the global community on side, because otherwise you will start to see the 140 countries that back Ukraine yesterday begin to fray. Very useful. Thank you, Richard, for your direct answering of a number of really tough questions. That's good. Um, Liat, can I turn to you next? I think you also have some really uh, fantastic questions aimed at you. Yeah, terrific questions. Thanks to uh, to Tracy for thinking of them and posing them. Appreciate that. So on the first one on the on the crypto ecosystem, you know, we're always talking about crypto being in its infancy, and um, you know, the 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 Bitcoin Satoshi white paper kind of appeared on the on the scenes in two thousand and eight. And, and we've been arguing that, you know, crypto is speeding to the moon at the speed of light. And everybody's always talking about going to the moon where, where there's a lot happening here. Um, and so while crypto wasn't able to absorb the Russian economy at this point in time, I think there's a fundamental learning that we really have to, um, to, to grapple with. And, and that is that governments have no choice but to wrap their minds around crypto and have clear policies and enforcement capabilities and regulations at this point in time. This cyber crypto warfare theater situation is, has really taken center stage and it's a watershed moment for crypto um, and there's recognition of that. And yet you see that governments are, are still in the position of you know, banning crypto, not wanting to talk about it, not wanting to think about it, um, avoiding it. Um, there's a massive need to reassess that right now. And there needs to be a whole of government approach to blockchain technology, what the implications of it are. Um, there's tremendous resources um, poured into it. And, and, and there's implications to ideological crowdfunding. You know, at this point in time, we can say um, that it's supporting Ukraine tremendously, but what happens when crowdfunding begins to, to find ideological warfare and other kinds of, of forays? And we've seen, you know, the, the likes of that and inklings of that with, with ISIL and, and other parts around, around the globe. So I think we always talk about, you know, when we, when we speak about terrorism and things like this is you need the means and the resources as well as the ideology and, and what you're seeing now is an absolute decentralized um, capability of providing means to a variety of causes. Um, uh, I would emphasize that crypto businesses and governments are now not flying blind. There's, there's you know, a, a stronger toolbox to deal with. It's a matter of how do we handle them. One of the things that I'm eyeing in the future and I'm concerned about is the development of privacy enhanced technologies and the governance frameworks around them. Um, you know, we, we do see that there are per perfectly um, legitimate use cases for technologies that anonymize funding sources, but what, what do we do with that when it comes to enforcing um, sanctions regimes or when it comes to, to other areas of, 
of governance. I think I think that's very important. Um, you know, I, I do see that there's a there's a bit of a of a balance of power tipping. Uh, we're seeing. Uh, I'll get very nitty gritty and detailed, but you know, practically speaking. Uh, I'm personally observing a brain drain from governments into the private sector, um, folks that have been working for years on um, financial institutional uh, policies, on um, a variety of compliance matters, regulatory frameworks, and so on, that are coming over to tech companies, and that's going to have implications to the workforce, the talent knowledge. Um, I think we should be investing more in financial literacy and, and what that means. Um, uh, specifically on Ukraine, there's a, there's a massive Ukrainian technology talent. Um, many, many um, technology companies have Ukrainian teams that support them. When we think about refugee resettlements, I think there's an opportunity there to maximize on you know, the creation of jobs that are really tech jobs that don't need to be um, hinged to a particular geographic location. So, there, so, so I think crypto as an ecosystem, as an industry, um, offers a variety of ways in which um, uh, the industry can support um, job creation, refugee resettlement, and practically um, governance mechanisms and structures. But it really, really requires governments um, to buckle into the to the discussion. You know, educate themselves on what it is that the technology does, what is its risks, its opportunities, and limitations, um, and get down to business because there's a lot happening here that that governments have to play catch up on. Um, and, and it's a massively resourced, well-resourced industry um, that, that deserves to have kind of a, a government partner. I think it speaks volumes for the opportunities for public-private partnerships. Um, and I think, you know, Tracy kind of pitched me two questions that put me up on a pedestal and I can ramp on for hours. So I'm just going to stop there. But um, really, uh, I, I do want to emphasize the silver lining of what is a really dire situation and the opportunities that we have um, to build at this time. All right. Well, thank you. I have uh, one more, thank you very much. I have one more written question, which I'm gonna pose to Colin. Um, and then I will do sort of a final quick round with each of you and I'll, I'll give you a head start. So Colin, um, and on the final round, I will say it again, but I'd love you to have, if there's one or two major thoughts or recommendations for the community that's listening in, I'll pose the question to you. So, but Colin, we've got a question from Felix LaPointe from Global Affairs Canada that you may be able to address. And uh, Colin writes, considering the implications of the Russian invasion of Ukraine are global, how will this affect the recruitment of people within terrorist and extremist groups? Will there be a rise of associates of extremist groups on that global level? So it's a pretty broad question, but I thought you might have some observations that would be helpful for Felix. Well, well, I'll say two things, and I think there's going to be an impact on both what we call um, here in the United States RIMV, which is racially and ethnically motivated violent extremism. But let's also not forget about jihadist groups. There's going to be an impact there as well, and I'll tell you how. First on RIMV, you know, right now you've got Russia fighting for what it, it views as an existential conflict in Ukraine. So it's pulling out all the stops. It's pulling back uh, Wagner mercenaries. Uh, you know, we've had conversations with uh, with entities in the U.S. government that said as much as 90 percent of Wagner resources are being pulled back to Ukraine. If, if that's true, that's actually going to impact the jihadi space, because if you think about places where the Russians are operating, even though they're known to you know, abuse human rights, there is some kind of security footprint for better or worse and oftentimes worse in these areas. So when you go from a security footprint to a power vacuum, that essentially allows some of these groups to kind of gain leverage. That's happening at the same time we've got this shift here in the United States and the West of this, you know, we're done with the global war on terrorism. We don't want to talk about it anymore. We did two decades. It's all about great power competition. So let's forget about the Sahel. Let's forget about the Horn of Africa, Southeast Asia. It's all about, you know, China, Russia, et cetera. The pendulum has swung from non-states to states. And too often we look at these issues as binary. There, it, it should be both, right? We should be concerned about states and non-state actors. We should be concerned about great power competition and counterterrorism. In fact, you know, you can't talk about great power competition without talking about counterterrorism. Um, I'm, I'm having flashbacks to this summer with Afghanistan and the either or nature of these debates, which I thought was wrongheaded. Um, the, the boost for REMV movements is going to be that the Russians are simple, simply, uh, you know, catalyzing and galvanizing those movements right now. We wrote a piece uh, in War on the Rocks last week, myself uh, and, and several of my colleagues at the Sufon Center, where we essentially talked about 
how Western fanboys of Russia are reacting online. And I can tell you the way they're seeing this conflict is much different than the way we're here talking about it today. They see this as uh, a, a war for uh, you know, civilization and the white race. And they look at Putin as representative of that, as the last best chance for white Christendom to, to survive. And so uh, that may very well result in some impacts in Europe with groups like the Nordic resistance movement in Scandinavia and elsewhere. The neo-Nazi white supremacist network is strong and, and very, very well may be motivated to act on the heels of what we're seeing happening now in Ukraine. So a lot of implications for terrorism and counterterrorism. Colin, that's extremely helpful. Thank you very much. I appreciate your one of your last points about either, you know, we're swinging the pendulum swinging from non-state actors to uh, great powers. And, and I'll say one thing from this conversation that I would observe is that violence in any kind of conflict is often aimed at civilians. And we have to shift from treating it as something that is a consequence of the war to sometimes a tactical and operational strategic aim of a conflict to, uh, as we're seeing in Ukraine. So I think that you probably are very knowledgeable about that because that's what non-state actors have been often accused of doing. We now see a state that's doing it. Um, all right, I'm going to do a lightning round for all of us to give each of our speakers a final chance to make a final recommendation or observation. Um, and then I have to hand it back to our hosts. So um, I, I've heard a lot today about governance, uh, the structures of the international system and both optimism and pessimism. But I think where you all seem to trend is that if the international system can both hang on to its interests and values, but not be static in the way it functions and not have the international community be too reactionary, like all in or all out, um, that we, we have a future that may actually work because all of you have pointed out that um, this is not a popular war with the international community. And while not everybody is voting for every General Assembly or Security Council resolution, uh, there are very few allies what Russia is doing. So um, just to set that up, um, why don't I go first um, uh, to Richard, then I'll turn to Colin and Leah to finish this off, and then I will finalize. Uh, so will the international system survive? Uh, and you're allowed to give us a recommendation, Richard, of any any point you want to make. Um, so look, I all I would say is that um, anyone who has been surprised that the UN response to this war um, has been a bit of a mess uh, hasn't been following the UN very closely. Um, in recent years, because the UN's response to the coup in Myanmar was a mess. The UN's response to the war in Ethiopia was, was a mess. I could go on. Um, I think we have to be really honest that the decline of the Security Council as a major actor in international peace and security um, has been quite a long process. Um, and uh, this accelerates it. Um, although, as I said at the start, I don't think the Security Council is altogether dead. I think what I see in this moment, though, is actually an opportunity for the UN and those countries that care about the UN really to show how the organization can respond to the global dimensions of this crisis, starting with refugees pouring into Poland and Moldova, and then going on to managing the food price shocks, the economic shocks, and, and other risks that are spinning out from the war in Ukraine. Because... Uh, even if the council is dead, even if peacekeeping is only going to ever be a tiny part of the answer to this conflict, if at all, um, the UN still has enormous tools and enormous convening power to manage some of the non-military, non-security dimensions of the global crisis that's emerging. And my recommendation, and I think this is what Guterres is doing, in part because he cannot really engage diplomatically in Ukraine, is for the UN to look at those issues. Um, because otherwise you're going to get a whole range of cascading unintended consequences, um, you know, riots in response to food prices, toppling weak states and so on. Um, that will just make this all worse. Excellent. Thank you very much. Colin. Yeah, I would just, you know, I want to kind of go back and, and end on something that Richard uh, had mentioned earlier, which was the need to provide off-ramps. A lot of the discussion I'm seeing now 
Um, and look, it's impossible not to be rooting for Ukraine, at least in my opinion, right? I mean, this is a small country that was attacked by a bigger country. Well, not a small country, but certainly attacked by a much bigger country, unprovoked, and its people are fighting valiantly. I mean, the bravery and the courage that we're seeing, and I don't know, I mean, maybe I'm just a victim of Ukrainian information operations, which are also, which are also pretty spectacular, I might add. Um, but look, this is a country fighting for the very ideals that many in the West take for granted. Um, you know, it's hard for me not to look at what happened on January 6th in my country and look at Ukraine and think, wow, you know, the, the very things that we hold dear and, and, and definitely take for granted, these people are giving their lives for. So I think it, that's a segue to say that it's, a, it, as Richard mentioned, we have to provide off ramps, right? It doesn't seem fair right? That the Ukrainian should have to give up anything or should have to concede at all. But that's the world we live in. Uh, and, and I think stopping the carnage is the first priority and then figuring out from there. It, it, Richard's also right that it's fun to talk about the punitive stuff, right? And what we should be doing to make Russia pay and to punish uh, Putin for his ill-fated adventure. Um, but at the same time, we need to do that in the parameters of keeping the unity and maintaining the unity of, of Western and NATO countries, which I think is you know, at a, at, a, at a fairly unprecedented level in terms of singing from the same sheet of music? And how do you kind of sustain that momentum, right, in a way that brings positive change? And, and then lastly, I just think we need to be a little bit concerned. And, you know, this is an unpopular opinion in some quarters of being overly punitive on the Russians and pushing them to a place where they can't come back from. Um, because then you're you're backing Putin into a corner. Then I think those conversations about tactical nukes become even more real. Um, but uh, Nick Miller, who's a professor at Dartmouth, said this on, on Twitter, of all places, and I've been thinking about it almost every day. He said, what we're doing right now is an experiment, because never in world history before have we strangled the economy of a nuclear-armed country that's headed by a dictator who's been in two years of COVID isolation. Uh, you know, this is all happening before our, our eyes, and it's not a game. So, I think we need to think really long and hard about what the potential implications are. And as unpalatable as it may be to do a deal with the Russians, we've got to stop the violence, we've got to stop the bloodshed, uh, and then we, we can figure out the rest from there. But to me, from a humanitarian perspective, that's the number one priority right now as I see it. And we, we need to do that in a way that maintains cohesion um, and you know actually gets the Russians to stop killing civilians. Thank you very much, Colin. Leah. Yeah, Richard and, and Colin have said it absolutely to a T. I, I, I agree absolutely 100% with everything that's been said. Um, the one piece I would add, or two pieces actually, is that um, you know th there's a massive misinformation and propaganda campaign ongoing, and uh, that has has significant implications in terms of the decision making and and you know where ideologically people align and so on. And I think that with social media platforms and so on, this is something that's going to continue to be, um, again, a fundamentally important part of the conflict um, de-escalation and resolution, but also of rebuilding and so on. Um, one of the, the key things that I'd like to, to propose and leave you with is that we will continue to see a convergence of typologies between traditional finance and crypto assets. So we'll be seeing more and more um, uh, uh, I guess, um, nexus points where crypto and, and banking are coming together. And that requires a significant amount of um, knowledge, attention, and, uh, and governance. So governments need to be prepared to talk about decentralized autonomous organizations, about DAOs. Governments need to understand non-fungible tokens and what that means. Governments need to know what decentralized finance is all about. Um, and, and that's a steep learning curve. So I'd really love for us to get moving faster on, on the innovation pieces because we're going to, we're already seeing right now with Ukraine, um, the concerns over women who are being trafficked into rings as they're leaving Ukraine. Um, and, and, and we know that um, crypto is, is sometimes used in, in many of these um, human networking or human smuggling networks. Um, so there's a, there's a clear need to address those hybrid um, intervention points where, where traditional finance and um, innovative finance come together. Uh, and, and I'll just leave that point there. Thank you very much. Um, well, I think you've all done a masterful job of both focusing on the immediate need to bring an end to this conflict and war in Ukraine and the human costs that we're seeing and the need for diplomatic 
solutions. And I would look forward to the next conversation where we then talk about how to implement all that. But in also doing so, you've each of you have highlighted major challenges and opportunities in the international system that are both uh, critical of what we're facing, but also forward looking. And for that, I wanna thank you. And thank you for spending the time with us today. To those of you who wanted to get a question in, I'm sorry, we had more than we could get to, and I apologize for that. But I'm very excited to say that we will be posting this uh, as a recording on the Global Center's website. If you're interested, get in touch or check the website out in a little while. Um, and I also want to thank the Global Center for putting one excellent panel together and inviting me to join you in conversation today. It's important work and uh, we will keep the conversation going. So thank you again. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, I'm now bringing this meeting to a close. Um, we'll see you in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much.